Hello everybody, welcome to episode 98 of the Online Tennis Podcast. I am honoured to tell you I've got Mr Gavin McMillan, of course he was on the show earlier in the year, to talk about Sabalenka's serve improvements. He's the biomechanics trainer for Arena Sabalenka, was able to help her fix her serve then. I'm here to talk with him again about serving in particular, but we can talk about a few other shots and kind of the favourites for, for Wimbledon, but I think a lot of it will be about kind of the technical the technicalities of some of the favourites for Wimbledon, basically in their, their shots, not just their serves. I think Novak's a good place to start. Right, We're talking about Wimbledon favourites. He is the Wimbledon favourite. I'm sure a lot of people would like to talk about him. He made a lot of improvements to his serve post kind of 2018, kind of when Vinicevic came into the, the, the scene and, and helped him with it. I know, I'll just say off the bat, I know for a fact his second serve even, and you were just talking about Sampras' second serve being one of the best of all time, right? I know Novak's is one of the faster on tour sometimes, and that ad site, he's able to attack almost. Craig O'Shaughnessy called it this hybrid serve that goes into the, the forehand side of his opponents on the ad side. One of the reasons it's so difficult to attack, even you know when you feel like you've got a sniff of a chance on break point on second serve against Novak, and he puts in this really sliding sort of second serve attacking there. Anyway, the point is he feels very comfortable in his technique nowadays. He feels very comfortable behind his serve, obviously. That's why he's been so difficult over the last five, six years at Wimbledon to defeat. He's won, by the way, 81% of his first serve points on grass in the last five years. And in the top 20 of this generation, of, of the last five years, by the way, he's the only guy apart from Federer that's less than six foot four tall. So it gives you an idea of just how technically sound his serve is. Here, there, there's a bit of food for thought, Gavin. What, what's your thoughts on Novak's serve? given a few of those points. Well, yeah, I think we touched on it the last time is that the improvement in his serve has been dramatic. Um, I saw uh, video footage of him serving in New York. I think it was from 2012, might've been 14. And, you know, he was standing on his knees trying to work on hitting up on it and stuff. His arm would open up in the back really bad. He's really changed how he brings his right arm up. And it's much more into a 90 degree angle. His palm stays down the whole time. When he, when, I've said this before, like when he's serving well, he's not beatable because it, once he gets into a groove where he can hurt you off that and he's not getting threatened, you know, on his service games, for sure he's going to break. He's got the best return in the world and he extends the point better than anybody else in the grass, you know, and he's able to start being a little bit more aggressive. Uh, it helps him out and especially helps out his serve. Even though the courts have been slowed down dramatically at Wimbledon compared to, you know, a decade ago, I think that, like I said, when he's serving well, he's he, he presents an enormous challenge because he backs it up with, you know, one of the best forehands in the world and one of the best backhands in the world. So if you're getting two free points, you know, per game out of your serve, it makes it really difficult for somebody to break you. So you talked about the hand being down. I know you, you talked about that a little bit in the last show, but there, there'll be people who haven't seen it anyway, but you almost compared it a little bit to, I think at the time, like a baseball pitch. And I remember Roddick's, Roddick has his racket down for quite a long time um, before then whipping through all of the last seconds. In terms of what it actually does to Novak's serve, though, you talk about the courts being a little slower. His placement, obviously, is impeccable. Does that help? With placement oh, yeah. and, and maybe how does it help with placement? I guess have you got a way to describe that? Well, placement is the most important thing. So it goes placement, spin, and speed, right? So like in baseball, if you have an enormous vertical drop in your pitches, it makes it very difficult to hit, regardless of of the speed. If you're pitching in a straight line and just ninety five mile an hour fastballs, these guys are too good. They're going to park it. So you have to have movement and. His placement in terms of the T-serve on the deuce side, the ability to hit it out wide off the deuce side is, is exceptional, especially when he's on. You can see when he gets tight, his left arm kind of drifts forward and he ends up pulling down on it. I think that's really the only technical thing you see really where when he's nervous and tight, like in the French Open final, like he was clearly nervous the first six, seven games, 12, 14, something like that on forced errors. And then once he calmed down, like, oh my goodness, I mean, it was just a clinic. And the first point of the tiebreaker, I mean, that forehand winner up the line he hit, you know, the confidence to be able to pull a trigger like that, you know, essentially the match was over at that point because now he have got his footing in, his confidence. It's like, where are you going to go at him? And, 
you know, it's a phenomenal trait that, that he has and that he can, once he gets on top of you, he can stay on top of you. So on the grass, if he's placing it well, you know, obviously the ball isn't, it can, it, even though the grass is slower, it's still grass. And it, and it helps in terms of, because he's not a guy that's serving 140, but he will be serving, you know, plus 120. And everyone knows, like, if you're essentially hitting, like, the right spot on a T-serve, 110 is going to be an eight. 120 something is not touchable. Same thing out wide, same thing on the ad side. You know, with these guys backing up as much as they have, nobody used to really do that. And now it's pretty common. Um, I think it just opens the court up even more for him. So, because that's one of the strategy, obviously, that Alcaraz used. He was moving around a fair amount on his serve in the semis. But again, it's, you know, dealing with the tension of the moment. It really comes down to the person's confidence in, in the shots they can execute. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, just touched on Alcaraz there. I'll bounce about, maybe we'll talk a bit about Novak again. But Alcaraz is obviously a very interesting prospect going into this Wimbledon. He's the second favourite. A lot of people maybe see him as the only competitor to Novak. I think that's unfair, but he's certainly up there. Maybe, I I think, as the second favourite, justifiably. You know, that Queen's one was pretty good. But there's a lot of stuff I want to talk about in terms of the serve for Alcaraz because it's mm. obviously when you watch it in terms of placement it is not like Novak's there's no way it's like Novak's right the, the pace is good you know you're talking like 130 plus a lot of the time at Queen's but you've just mentioned the three kind of priorities and speed can sometimes be the, the lowest one well, I think it is the lowest one and I think you have to start with a placement like Alcaraz so he's changed his motion if you look back to even two years ago I was working with uh, Brandon Nakashima at the time, and he I think he played him in Europe on red clay and was up a break in the third, and I was watching him, and I thought, you know, the kid's a good athlete and everything else, but clearly there's some things not great there. A year later, he's a phenomenal athlete, not a good one, because when you saw him, like, in the next-gen tournament, some of the balls he tracked down were just a joke. And then they what they did, because he used to open his arm up, you know, in, on his serve motion, and now they've abbreviated it, and they, he brings it there, and then he brings it there. So it comes inside. And he's not, like, doesn't have great location on it, but what he does do well is he hits it pretty with pretty good velocity, but he's always hitting up on it. And so the ball is always hitting, and it's not in a comfortable place to attack. And once that happens, right, like you're not putting him on defense off that first one. He's got a big, big advantage then because – First of all, no one has a harder forehand when he gets a hold of it. I think Novak's under pressure is is better, but and certainly smoother. But the rotational torque he puts on on a forehand is unbelievable, and so he gets you know he backs it up with a with a huge punch. So yeah, right from the get go, you've got a guy, and now you're you're the best retriever in the sport athletically. It's you know the question is going to be for him as his career continues to go because you have to start kind of questioning like what's going on off the court and what are they doing physically with him? Mm -hmm. He's had a lot of injuries already for a kid that's 20 years old. Mm -hmm. Everybody tries to blame it on how explosive he is and how athletic he is. And yeah, I get it. But you know, if he's weightlifting and doing stuff like that, where it literally causes the muscles to grow the wrong direction, you start getting soft tissue injuries that mount. You have to stay loose and elastic, especially in this sport, because you have to be able to do this for five hours and you have to be able to be explosive for that, you know, amount of time. And he's, you know, explosive off that first step, but saying like he's a better tennis mover than, than Novak, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that Novak's flexibility, his ability to lengthen himself, extend the points is, you know, is, is as good as it gets. A lot of people obviously see him as the second favourite. Do you think the serve is good enough now for him to win Wimbledon? You're saying it's probably incredibly heavy, heavy enough that that plus one is going to be easy for him to play and he maybe got the best uh, forehand in the game, as you as you say. So, you know, if he can get a hold of that, maybe that's enough, you know, in these quick courts. Or do you think maybe there's something holding him back that will stop him from getting the title? I mean, maybe the experience of having to play enough on grass and he's really shown that he can change like his return position so he can stand back or he can stand in and take it early and really put a lot of pressure on you. If he's, you know, serving effectively, the pressure's off him to, to hold because he, he backs it up with so many different things. I mean, he's got the best drop shot that's ever existed in men's tennis. 
And the, the forehand one in particular that he hits almost like inside out, it, I don't know what the percentage of points he wins from that is, but it's enormous. And he's in control of the point. And he's also a phenomenal net player. When you look at his athletic ability at the net, you know, his first round and Hollywood was struggling, but the guy was hitting huge. It's Rinder catcher. And I, I, Rintu, I don't, yeah, I don't say catcher. his name properly, so sorry. <laughs> um, but in Queens even, in Queens, but yeah. Not where it was, it's Queens, yeah. Had him on his back foot and stuff. So guys like that, like where they can, again, put him on the defensive early off the first shot. You know, it's a problem on grass like that. Somebody like Kyrgios obviously can do that to anybody. But absolutely, Alcaraz has a chance. Like, come on. He's playing phenomenal. The improvement in him in the last 18 months is is enormous. It's not a little bit. Like, he, he knows how to play within himself. He knows when to really be aggressive. Doesn't give matches away. He's really come a long way in the last uh, couple of years. And... It is going to, I think the challenge for him is obviously is going to be the physical side. And is he able to maintain this? We'll see. Yeah. To, you have to be athletic, athletic enough to make guys have to hit that extra shot. And so we've never really seen somebody that's six, six and up that can maintain that level of athletic ability and movement to really extend the points like that. Now that, you know, when you look back at Krychek and Steak and guys like that, that served huge they're taking the racket out of your hand, you know, yeah. and you're not getting enough looks. Zverev, when his first serves on, can do that to you for sure. But his second serve is a glaring weakness. Yeah. I've said this a million times. Like, you fix his second serve, watch out. I, I mean, because he's a great mover. I know he's had a bad injury, but he's a phenomenal mover on the court. He's really good from the backcourt. He's got length. You know, he's a good athlete. But that flaw... His velocity goes from 135 to 86. Yeah. And when he's tight, you know, because of the way his arm goes away from him, it can just, the mechanics alone cause a hesitation. And, you know, this is already rolled forward, so he loses his stretch reflex. The reason why your palm down, because it internally rotates your, your arm, and now your pec's stretched out, right? So then it's throwing. So it goes from here to here. His is going that way, it goes there, and then he tries to drop it and hit up. And that's what I did. And a thousand other people I know, because we're taught like this down together, up together, and your arm's like in the wrong position. Serving is throwing. You're throwing the racket through the ball. And it's no, that's why I said before, it's the same thing as throwing a football, throwing a baseball. Throwing's throwing. The plane of movement's different. Tennis is up. Baseball is in a down angle. Quarterbacks are a flat angle and sometimes in an up angle for the deep one. Yeah. So you can't change just because you put a tennis racket in your hand. You can't then say, okay, I'm not throwing. You're yeah. throwing. It's a throwing motion. You know, people are doing the best they can. And you look back at the coaches I had, they were teaching what they were taught or what they saw. And we didn't have that, the ability with videotape that you have now. And so if you start looking at like the commonalities between Sampras or Federer and Roddick and things, they're actually all doing the same fundamental things the same. You're going to see their left hip is out. They're going to see counter rotation of their upper spine. They're going to see the arm is pointing down somewhere in their motion because it has to be, to be an elite server. And I remember Roddick, he doesn't get enough credit. Like, again, I watched a match back with him at Wimbledon with um, Roger. The, The level of tennis was absolutely absurd. And the guy, to say he's born in the wrong era, you know, when he first came on, I saw him play Sampras at uh, in Indian Wells, and he just hit him off the court. You know, between his forehand and his serve, it was like, oh, my God. And no one really taught that motion, right? Because he kept, you know, his feet together, and, you know, it's a platform stance, but he did it much differently than, say, in the, in the wind-up part than, than Sampras or Federer did. But you can see the common parts that they all all do the same. So now it's like if you're looking at an elite server, placement wise, Novak for sure. Second serve, I think you know he gets a little shaky with it later lately. But when he is hitting it well and hitting up on it, people aren't really able to attack it. And that's that's if you're not attacking him on that, then you're you're going to have a problem yeah. getting pressure pressure on him, right? Zverev. Like when his first serves on, obviously it takes the racket out of your hands. He did that to Alcaraz at the French last year. But the the flaw in his second serve showed up with 
in the next round with uh, with Nadal. Yeah, um, and I, I'm a huge fan of his. I just think that you know he could he could make a real run to the top if he can get that sorted because it feed, it ends up affecting right everything else. Like when you start feeling tight on that, start hesitating off the ground, you're not as you know because there's so much pressure to win those points now. Mm-hmm. Speaking of six foot six movers, you know you can get the ball back. We have to talk about Daniel Medvedev, who's actually right up there in terms of the bookies' favourites. I think a lot of people have him up there as well as a potential, you know, outsider to those two. Obviously, you know, his ground game can be a little passive. Sometimes people say that makes him a little weaker in grass, but he keeps it flat through the court. You know, it's very low shots. They're difficult to attack. His serve is big, but is there maybe, I I feel like it's not something you mentioned, and I I might feel the same way. I don't really totally rate Medvedev's serve, because it can be up and down. Well, he hasn't been playing that well, so, and and in tennis, like, confidence is everything, right? So, I think that that is a problem for him. Obviously, to be fair, Gavin, he did start playing well from, like, February to sort of, you know, May or so. He was winning titles, and his serve mm. did kind of follow suit with that. So I, I think what you're touching on is confidence is key for Medvedev, and he'll serve well when he's feeling confident. Confidence, for, it's for everyone. And, you know, obviously, Novak's confidence at this point is <laughs> on a different level with 23 slams behind you. But Medvedev's serve, like, when his first serve's on, you, he's very, it's virtually impossible to break him. His second serve, he used to dull fault uh, and be super aggressive with it. I, th- I think in, in fact that the ability the fact that he can't hit some spin and shape it more off his backhand sometimes hurts him and, it, and then he gets a little bit more passive off the, off the forehand side and he gets into those patterns especially where he's standing like all the way back and and so you're always kind of in a different position and on, on the faster courts you know you're giving a guy too many opportunities and because you're not hurting him off the return at all. So I think that it, it'll be interesting to see like how he approaches it this year. He is obviously it's not a tournament he's had a ton of success at. I don't know what they're working on. I don't know what they focus with him in terms of here's what we need to do to win. You know, clearly he can do that. Uh, it's just the surface it starts you know messing with you when you start slowing everything down at the French, getting that many balls back and really extending the points. It's a difficult thing for him. You would think like. If you can hit that, you know, that flat off the backhand and be that aggressive with it, that should be able to hurt a lot of people, especially on grass. So, but I think if you back up too far, that's a problem. Yeah, that's a good point compared to somebody like Alcaraz, right? Who's going to take the ball back early and it's going to be tough to, to play. What I like about him is that he can do it early, but he can also stand back. So he can give you different looks and, and it's the same thing. in like in a baseball pitcher, right? You, you can't just keep, you know, putting fastballs over the plate. These guys are too talented, and sooner or later they're going to put it in the stands. So you notice, like, Akras will change his position. That changes what your opponent's looking at. Yeah. So it makes it look different where you can go and what you can be aggressive with and what you can't. Yeah, I, I mean, I should rephrase it, Gavin. He does go back, but he gets it back too quickly. Like he can still be aggressive from there. Yeah. yeah. The one thing that he can do, I think, really well compared to a lot of other guys is he can step inside the service line, especially off that higher backhand and be aggressive with it. Um, And he's shown that repeatedly. So Medvedev, you don't really see him do that too often. He's not putting you under the same type of, you know, type of pressure in terms of taking time away from your opponent. Probably not not rating Medvedev too much for the tournament. I I mean, there's people he'll get the better of, right? But... Well, we'll see. Like, and it all depends on your draw. And again, like, if he gets a draw that's favorable to him, gets a couple wins under his belt, and his confidence clicks back to what he's capable of doing in a lot of situations, he's a tough guy to beat. I mean, he's beaten everybody at some at one point or another. So, yeah, you know, writing him off, it's just you look at like who's who's feels good right now and who's executing. And you know, he struggled the last few tournaments, and so his confidence probably isn't as high, but he's still you know world-class tennis player and and once you get on a roll and start playing better and confident and it just changes everything but yeah i definitely have seen that with him in particular he, he can make some pretty rash decisions as well you talked about the second serve and um, yeah when he's on he is on so maybe a bit of momentum and he could be dangerous somebody by the way gavin sorry to dart about but somebody i really want to talk about is mm-hmm. yannick center because he did well last year 
right? Mm-hmm. We've seen him on grass be a little bit up, a little bit down. Obviously, his shots are bigger than pretty much you know anybody else's. He can match people for pace for sure. That's why it's such a problem for Carlos. If we're talking serves, I mean, Yannick has toyed with his stance repeatedly for starters. So he's went from pinpoint to platform. Now he went back to plat- uh, pinpoint even for this grass season. His serve for me has has never been so that's that is Yannick. That's his bread and butter. How do you read it? And is that going to be impactful for Wimbledon? Could that maybe hold him back? I think so. And it's interesting you bring him up because when we're when I was with Arena at the US Open last year, we were practicing next to him. And when we were walking off, he was serving and doing nothing but serving. And she's like, he tossed the, the ball too far out in front of him, right? And I was like, yep. And so like when the ball is out in front, you you have you obviously have to move forward to it. And so your contact point right? The angle changes and you'll see with him, like he struggles in big moments to hit his serve effectively and make big first serves when he needs it. Like that happened in New York last year against Alcaraz because he had real, some opportunities there. In my opinion, I don't think he gets his left arm enough on the right side of his head. I think the ball toss is too far forward. And so he ends up hitting it too far in front of him and ends up hitting down on it. The ball can sail on him. And I think that when you look at him, the changes, you know, going from pinpoint back and forth to platform, you know, it tells you that you're not 100% comfortable with what you're doing. So, yeah, I think that he's great off the ground. I really like the way he competes. But the the serve is definitely a thing where if they can get that up, because he's if he changes that and the percentage is high, like if a guy like that's serving 120 and he can make it 65, 70% of the time, you're going to have a tough time breaking them. But when you start dropping into 50%, now you're getting a second serve look every other point. Everything changes in terms of the pressure. So, you know, center obviously is a guy that from the backcourt can cause problems for everyone. So, yeah, if his serve gets to a different level, which I think it can, then watch out. Maybe. I, it sounds like what you're saying is there's maybe not as much weight as well because you're saying he's hitting down on it a lot, mm-hmm. right? So it's, it's maybe not quite as spinny. It's not quite as, yeah, quite as much. Tough, right? Because your left arm, his left arm, I, in my opinion, gets out in front of him too far. And so you lose counter rotation of your upper spine as well. Um, the ball toss, you don't want it too much more than necessarily like a foot, foot and a half at the most inside the court you still have to rotate to it but you you want it at the at the highest point that you can extend it's just geometry right from that point then you're just drawing a line based into the court unless you're hitting it with spin and the ball is taking a different path yeah so it creates a get a window that you can hit it through and still and still make it when it gets out to too far in front of you that that ge- geometric line drops and so now that space that you can make it in is a little bit smaller. And at the highest levels, that's really all it takes, you know, because if you're dropping your percentages by 10%, now Opera is, is running around and hitting a forehand off your second serve whenever he can. Now he's in control. And if he gets on top of you off that first ball, you're in trouble. So so those those four players, it's interesting you're saying that about Sinner and Medvedev, I think. And even Zverev, I think all these guys, you, you feel like maybe a few improvements to really have been in with a chance this year. It does feel like it's a two-hour race. There's other players, though, Gavin. I, I just, I'll touch on them. Is there anybody you would pick out? So I was thinking, obviously, Fritz, Rune, maybe Kerrios, but not really. It's unlikely he's going to be fit enough. Corda, are any of these players guys that come to mind? Is there anything that you pick out from there? I mean, obviously, it has to go Novak, Alcaraz, and then everyone else. I think, you know, Alcaraz, if, if, if he doesn't come up against big servers early and he starts settling in, he's going to be just a nightmare. He knows how to play tennis. Everybody doesn't discuss that enough. He has great shape on his shots. He's a great defender when he needs to defend. So he extends the point, makes you hit another shot, even though he's terribly out of position. He volleys exceptionally well. He comes in off really intelligent shots. Again, the change they've been able to get in him in the last two years is unbelievable. Uh, In the big moments, is is he going to be able to pull that off on grass? Well, that's why we play the tournament, right? You find out. I'm, yeah, I'm saying those names and nobody's totally inspiring me. Maybe Kyrgios is very best would have a chance on serve, but honestly, I don't see that happening. You brought up Korda. I think he, 
you know, he looks just stiff. I know they said that they spent like a couple months, like bulking him up like that. Why, why would you do that? You, extra mass is not going to help you on a tennis court. In fact, it'll hurt you. And you have to carry that body weight around for f- four or five hours. You know, he's a very flat hitter and can get very stiff um, on certain shots. Um, when he's on, like obviously what he did to Medvedev in Australia, he's a, he's a difficult out. But, you know, Alcaraz has that other gear, as you just showed. So I think that, again, it depends on who you match up with, right? He, if he matches up against Alcaraz in the quarters, I don't, that's, to me, that's not a great matchup for him, but he can obviously do a lot of damage, especially in the first few shots of early in a point. The longer the point goes on, obviously his margin of error isn't quite the same as, as an Alcaraz's or Novak's or people like that. So it's a tough to be able to pull that off for seven rounds. You know, again, you're being super, we're being, you know, a little super critical in terms of, because it's the men, right? It's so difficult to win. He's one of the nicest people on tour, works his ass off. And, you know, when I was working with Brandon, we practiced with him several times. And, you know, I hope he does well, because, he, you know, when you start getting hurt at his age and stuff, it, it's not fun. Yeah. I'm looking at his game and going, how do you win the, how do you win the tournament? Yeah, and yeah, how do you win seven matches in a row? Exactly. Right. What can prevent you from doing that? I think a little more shape on his shots especially in the critical moments makes a big difference for him. But again, that's just my opinion. Gavin, I think I'll probably wrap up the men's there. Generally, the takeaway there is you're probably expecting a Novak Carlos final. You have to wait and see when the draw comes out Friday and see who's a threat to them, especially early. Um, Because everybody's nervous and you're adjusting to the environments. And obviously Alcaraz isn't going to see anything but center court. Same with Novak. That's an advantage, uh, certainly, um, because that's not going to be the case for everybody else he plays. I, they clearly are the two top favorites, and then you just got to look at the draw and see who can threaten him. And then also with, with Alcaraz, is he physically going to hold up? Uh, he had to pull out last year, didn't play the year-end tournament, even though he qualified because he had an abdominal muscle tear. Yeah, Australia um, as well, of course. And then missed Australia because of it. It's a lot of injuries for, for somebody that young. And again, I'm not, I haven't seen enough of what he does physically to have an opinion, but I've spent a lot of time in that field, obviously, and something's not right. I don't know what it is. Yeah. So we'll see. You wish him the best. And he's great for the sport. His athletic ability is phenomenal and has a great attitude on the courts. And, you know, what's, what's not to cheer on? Fingers crossed. Um, I'll wrap up this men's episode. Gavin, thank you very much for joining us. Please check out Gavin Sports Science Lab. Pleasure to have you on as always. This has been On The Line. Wimbledon men's preview in a way. Thank you very much for joining us, guys. Um, We'll catch you next time on the podcast. Cheers.